IO card, we'll go that into a little bit. Uh, we find the controls, narratives, control philosophies, work with the chemical engineers and really nailing down how this thing is going to work. And actually developing all the visualization, data historian, data acquisition systems, and then doing the actual programming and configuration and factory acceptance sensor of these devices. And then we get involved with the pre-commissioning. It's a term that, that really is validated in every component of the plant, every valve, every transmitter, every signal, you know, and then pre-commission, which is when you start bringing out the process into the into service and you validate that as well. Uh, so that's pretty much how, how we allow the control sits on, on the project. For example, right now we're doing a project with Fluor out of Canada. Now Fluor is a big engineering outfit, so they'll do the whole design process, you know, the, the, the actual civil mechanical structure. But when Reliable comes in, we partner with them and do the automation for the process controls, and we do the commissioning for them. Now, one of the key things to, to keep in mind, and I like this, is big journeys begin with small steps. <coughs> and there's a lot of, you know, there's a reason why you guys are here. Because you guys want to change the world. That's, that's a real fact. I believe that because I'm an engineer and I believe that as well. One of the things to keep in mind in every project, uh, there's many ways to describe it, but everything starts with a concept, an idea. Somebody comes up with some weird or crazy idea that goes, yeah. Then it's got to be developed. Then it's actually executed and then it's completed and turned over. And this is what I'm showing you is just the man hour. But throughout this pro process, you got to do the concept, take it to feasibility level, there's bankable, so my people will give the money to the work, you got to develop the project, and then you got to actually build it, construct it, test it, prove it, and then you got to close it out. And then your, your operation. I want to go pretty high level, but if you guys want me to dig in some of these topics, just let me ask, ask me a question, okay? Now, if you guys are chemical engineers, you're familiar with this. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, this has changed history, right here, uh, uh, chemistry. Yeah. Now, uh, you guys do this too, right? <laughs> then, then you prove your concept. First you put it on paper, work it out, all the details, then just try it out in the lab. Okay, let's test it, let's prove it, and make sure that the chemistry, make sure the right temperatures, make sure that Flows, but you're the quantities, parts per million, you name it, all the jargon that you guys are very good at, but you got to prove your, 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 your concept in, in a laboratory. And then, well, you got to decide it. Uh, you know, this is a uh, picture of pests, just a pipe and an instrumentation diagram. Really, you show your flows, the processes, how much capacities, uh, everything, all your components are, are, uh, are required to, to take your concept that was done in the lab into something that's commercial. Now, one of the things that, for example, reliable controls does is during the engineering process is what we call a control scenario. Really, you don't have the time to sit down and learn all the programming language that's gonna go in that black box that's gonna control <laughs> your process, but now you gotta rely on the electrical engineer to do that, right? But you have to put it in a piece of paper that is both in English and logical and systematic. So it's very important to clearly define the expectations. And this is done with the process engineer, in this case your guys, in defining, hey, at this temperature we need to shut this down. Or at this pressure, this pipe might break. So let's control this. That's got to be defined. And really, this becomes the Bible for everything that's going to go into programming these process controls, validating it, testing it, and really becomes your operations manual at the end of the day. Next one, uh, cause and effect diagrams. Uh, get those skills, this is a very, very important. Especially with dealing with hydrocarbons or, you know, uh, cyanide, we do we have that with that in uh, gold production. Nasty chemicals. Now, cause and effects. And what this is, is when this happens, this action is to happen. And this is really a viable. Actually, o uh, OSHA requires hydrocarbon plants under uh, ESN compliance to have this type of documentation in place because of safety uh, of, uh, reasons. But again, this is working as a team and developing this type of engineering documentation. Next is uh, quality control. 
Now you got to make sure that guy's going to go to the field. He's going to have the right documentation to validate and verify what's you know, being constructed and what's being tested. And then you got to have procedures. Because the way you do it, the way she does it, might be different in the field. So you got to understand. And we're going to get a lot into a little bit into instrumentation because that's going to be your eyes and sensors out of the field. But you need to have consistency. Have these sensors installed, calibrated. Therefore, the data that's coming into your computer is it's accurate and you can actually control and you recover. And developing how you're going to start up a plant. You know, you introduce water, you, you, you circulate, and you add a chemical. You know, it's not, it doesn't happen all at once. It's really system by system as you bring up a plant and you validate, test, and prove. I mean, you got to go through a very, very detailed uh, approach to doing this. Right. And you know, once you know the concept, uh, and I show this picture here because there's the engineer that designs it, there's the engineer that builds it with the construction company, but then there's the finance people. So you got to work with that. Make sure that your product, the way you engineer it, the way uh, you propose to build it, the way you're going to test it, bring it to service, there's an ROI. Uh, the banks like it, and people are going to fund the project. So. I use just that just to keep that in mind when you design and I use the word fit for purpose. You don't want to build a Cadillac really when you, when you can get away with, with a Lexus or, or a Camry to say. Uh, and those are things that are important in the design process and also the implementation of your process control. Now there's a lot of different process control platforms. Uh, BCS, PLCs, I mean there's all kinds of systems. Again, you also have to look at it what is practical what is uh, really necessary. If you're in South America, for example, Siemens is uh, very popular. People know Siemens. Go ahead. Just a question. Uh, could you explain PLC and BCS? By all means. If they come from, you know, that's, I love that question. Because, uh, does anybody know what PLC and BCS is? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A PLC is a programmable logic controller. Okay. A BCS is the distributed control system. Uh, the, why the difference? And they come from two different worlds. Back in the 1970s, in the uh, uh, vehicle production, 1960s, I think, it was Monica and Schneider, they would have these relays, okay, on off relays that would control the robots or that would control equipment. So you had what was called relay logic. So if this condition is true, this is false, you light up a relay, and then, you know, you, so it's really very, very digital control logic. So, the PLC is really the digital form of, the, of that type of control approach. A distributed control was different. It came more from the process side, and it was a lot of pneumatics. So you had pneumatic systems that would measure. It was you know, electromechanical relay, so uh, and from, uh, uh, impulse lines, you name it. And it would be all mechanical and pneumatic that would control a feedback uh, control. A feedback loop means uh, electric car in your vehicle. You said 65 miles an hour, speeds up, slows down. Well, you have a valve that wants to control flow. You have a flow meter. So that type of feedback uh, loop control, that's from the pneumatic world. And that drew into a DCS system, which are oh, totally uh, digital now. They're computerized, but that's why the two terms come together. And now really, they're merging very closely uh, in their implementation. Big players are Emerson, ADD, Rockwell, uh, different brands. And uh, I think you know, Japan's care, I mean, this is made of different systems. Maybe just one, one other question. You mentioned a little bit about programming. What kind of programming languages do you use? What kind of, uh... yeah, that's, that's very good. Uh, when, when programming the systems, uh, obviously there's ladder logic, which is the basic you know, on-off control. Uh, then you have function blocks, which are predefined uh, function blocks that you put in together. And you can say, okay, this is my input variables. This is what the outcome's gonna be. It could be a feed forward control. It could be a PME block. Uh, you work with that. You have sequential controls. You have adaptive controls. I mean, you, you, you have different types of, uh, of uh, control modules or program that, that you utilize. And again, what's fit for purpose. And what, uh, we have a client, for example, people back more. They like to use ladder logic because it's easy for the electricity to troubleshoot. You have another client in Chile, they like function block because it's easier for the, so you kind of have to balance it, but that's the different type of uh, languages that I used to. 
I don't think, uh, you know, it's good to know them, but the people that actually program these things, you just gotta know what they're doing and which ones to apply. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. And then, we, you know, the holiday is once you get your van and all that, you build something, right? Uh, and you're happy and life is good, but inside of all of this, you're gonna find this. Uh, I tried to illustrate this. Have you guys been inside a big refinery or a process plant, chemical plant, or mining operation? Yeah. So, I mean, this, this is typical. Big equipment, scary, loud, noisy. A lot of pressure, a lot of flow. You know, it's you know, stuff that you need to control. That's for your process. Then you got things like autoclaves, right? You guys don't want to autoclave this at a night, probably. Well, we use them a lot. Again, what happens? High pressure, uh, high temperature, you're oxidizing something, etc. You come across these things in the field. That's what you you're, that's what you design, that's what you process that up to do. And then you have these nasty little things. <laughs> these are all the nerves, all your signals, how you're gonna measure the flow, the temperature. And you know this tricky about this because if it's a place where it's very uh, corrosive, you need to specify the right answer. Need that type of resolution, and really, you got to put a lot of emphasis in specifying the right instrumentation. And finally, it all comes into a PLC or DCF. If it is a PLC, all of these wires are coming in from the field. These are controllers, and we have hundreds of these throughout the facility. This is your computer, and then you visualize all this thing. Think of Star Wars, where all these bits of information are displayed for an operator to uh, act on. Be an alarm, initiate it, and, you know, do what he needs to do, and then take action and actually run the facility. Now, I'm going to kind of summarize this. So, when you look at a plant like this, you know there's process and equipment involved in all of these. There's definitely a lot of process control, visualization, and global connectivity. And this uh, uh, new name, this generation, I mean, they're talking about buying up the future or things like that, where you'll be able to. Uh, you run a facility from, let's say, Salt Lake City, that's maybe in Alaska, and to do it from here. You know, this, this, I mean, the, the future is amazing what's going on. Uh, this, again, you know, visualization is for decision making, cost, and equipment control. You have to management, productivity, and efficiency. All of that needs to come in play because somebody's got to maintain it, right? Somebody's got to make sure and calibrate it and do all the stuff for the facility. Now, this is where the chemical and the electrical engineers, you know, they, they come together. This is where your, your electrical engineer pretty understands this. It's the controllers and equipment control and all these wires and all these things and all these computers. Uh, going to PLCs. Uh, if you have a chance to take a class to understand some of this stuff, uh, equipment control, Boolean logic, it's helpful. <coughs> because really what a PLC is, that's what it is. It's on off control. And that's what's going to control your <coughs> conveyor belts, your fans, your pumps, and all this stuff. Understanding this actually is pretty good. It's boring, but it's fun. We <laughs> <laughs> have one question right here. Yes. Um, you talked about like the global stuff, like running a plant from somewhere where it's like different. Yeah. How do you deal with like security then? I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. But that, that's a very good question because that that's happening uh, with that's where the IT guys come in and then. We'll go. <laughs> 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 but uh, I'll get to that in a minute, okay? Because that's part of this presentation. And then, obviously, some of you might have uh, you know, process control system. And maybe th this is important to understand, primarily for uh, stability. You see, you can have multiple loops, right? Uh, process, temperature, flows, but you gotta balance your plant. Otherwise, it'll go really, you can go crazy, and you can spill, you can get really nasty. So, understanding this type of phase IF, or see, stability, feedback loops, I highly recommend but, you know, get, get a, a good understanding in developing this. Go ahead, sir. So in this class, we're tuning PID control. Beautiful. You have to do that a lot in your company. All the time. Uh, uh, you know, Ed, I like to do it. I like to do it. We're not very good at it. You know, the most amazing thing is, I, I started, you know, one of my first projects was went to Chicago and we did a project, and I'm an electrical engineer, so I didn't know much. I can't you come to the chloride, you're gonna have to take the component out and just throw in and like, okay. Yeah. But anyways, tune in a loop is so critical. And uh, a lot of people will say there's this auto-tune features and all these great things, that, that's fine. But if you are able to 
understand how to tune a loop, understand the timing of what the differential of the energy, you know, the derivative functions of that loop, and if it's cascaded or within another loop, and the whole balance, you're way ahead in, in, in ensuring that, you know, that's really process control. So, put that one put a lot of effort to sleep. Be exercised. Do you have a fish tank practice with it? <laughs> well, of course, that's a good fit, right? Uh, uh, the, uh, and this, again, but everything has to come into the, again, you got to deal with these parties, right? Because everything is inputs, outputs, communication lanes, radios, interfaces, vendor systems. So, again, you're working with the electrical engineers and building these things. It's a partnership. And just inputs and outputs, both digital and analog. analog. To us, analog means everything that's variable, like speed or temperature or flow. Digital is really, really fun. Uh, another thing that I, I, I ask is understand more. The motors really are the, they're the workers. I mean, they're the ones that are going to drive your pumps, they're going to drive your equipment, your belts. Uh, yeah, it's good to understand how those, how, those, how those things work. And the different types of controllers. Uh, maybe not power distribution, but it's important because you need energy. Uh, VFDs, uh, definitely understand how they work, what the purpose is, uh, and instrumentation. Again, all of this is, that's where I, the, the beauty of this is working with electrical and chemical working together. So a lot of this is, you know, electrical engineering uh, work. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to define to the guys is, I process, again, you know, this is very simplistic, uh, it's a flow tube, transmitter goes into the PLC or DCS, comes out and controls the valve. And then the motor really is on off and so interlock devices, etc. And everything goes to your process control system, not a historian, but all the other systems that go And it's good to understand the differentiation because really it's a different approach to uh, doing Again, even machine interface, I think I went over that. Initiate, trend, analyze, operate. Uh, the screen design is very important, so you're providing the operator the right data that he needs to have in order to operate the plant safely, or shut it down safely. And going now into data management, you know, nowadays, you know, there's laboratories in every plant when you actually have, now it's real time. And the more information you have in data management, I mean, this is the stuff because, you know, you're running plant, but you want that information on a daily basis so you can measure, maybe tweak, optimize, improve, have that real information coming in that's accurate, and you can uh, make corrective actions or even design changes to the facility as you're building it, or as you're operating it and improving it. And there's the IT world. Uh, that's where you come in, and everything has got to be secure. You don't want it to be hacked. You don't want to put it in there. So it's got to be reliable multiple layers of communication protection, redundancy, scalable, modern, and really you have to look at, you want to be able to control and visualize from anywhere in the world, but you want to make sure that you're secure. And that's where the, the IT practices come into place to ensure that that data is secure. For example, right now we're doing a project for uh, tech up in Canada, the removal of selenium out of the water. And actually from our offices, uh, we have a screen uh, here, a program that we can actually access the facility as we work right next to it. This is by the off river outside of Princeton, uh, British Columbia, and be able to control it. But security is so cru crucial in order to be able to do that. And that, there's a lot of effort behind that. Ensuring it's not just connecting and, you know, virtual level, but it's, it's quite a bit of architecture in order to get to that part of the project. So, are you creating your own software and like user interface for this? No, that each each one of those uh, products has their let's say the software, but we are the ones configuring that. Okay. So it's like they, it's it's like they have a MATLAB. When I think of a uh, user MATLAB, like mm -hmm. they have modules, but you select them, you put them together, you create actually a design how it's going to look like, what type of controller, uh, what type of uh, inter uh, cascade feedback, feed forward, you name it. You're the one doing all that. Uh, so that's uh, answering that because I mean in, in a global sense. The uh, one of the thing, uh, things I like to talk about is you know opportunities. We live in a really 
and this is my personal point of view where I see a lot of opportunities coming up. What I'm going to share this with you. And, uh, and then I'll talk to you about some of my experiences in, in, the, in the real world. You know, and, and we're going to talk about something very important here. You know, as a species, I, like, like I said, we've come a long way. So you know, how is that it? You know, in the last 200 years, we came from this to this. <laughs> from this. No perubus. I still don't know where that. Anyways. To this, I mean, you know, here it's, you know, fertilizers and all of that. I mean, well, there's a lot of chemistry here, yes. Uh, from this to this. And, uh, I mean, this is you know, 150 years. Like that. Uh, good, point. good thing we're not there, right? Good thing it happens. <laughs> I mean, worldwide, you know, we have done amazing, amazing things uh, in the last 150 years as, as a human species. You know, we got from this, which that is still a chemical reaction, <laughs> to today we have LEDs, right? Again, there's also a lot of stuff behind it. I mean, and this one has been in the last five years, I think. So just, just to give you some concepts of how fast things are moving. I mean, to think about all of these great things that have accomplished are we, thanks to engineers, scientists, and people, you know, like yourselves, getting out there. What has what have that happened? Look at the life expectancy of I mean, really, it is, it's phenomenal, thanks to engineering, you know. Uh, incrementality is there. I mean, think about it. It's all because of engineering, and science, all of these things that we are looking at. Exponential population, right? Now what does that mean? Well, we need more power. Well, we need more food. Well, we need more clean water. We need more fuels. We need more metals. And we have to be very, very smart, very intelligent, very savvy on how to improve limited resources, uh, how to clean the water. How, I mean, there's amazing opportunities how to make this a better world. And that, that challenge, guys, is some third generation. You guys are going to talk about all of this. The, uh, the innovative is the resources we need. And, you know, without food, uh, you know what I'm saying? We, we need this. We need these resources. And one of the concepts that I like to use in explaining uh, in a very simplistic way, and I think all you guys can relate, but everything, everything that is on this, that you own, uh, material, you know, this computer, everything has a life cycle, a life cycle process. Well, everything comes from the ground, really. It's an abstraction process of mine. It's a processing plant, chemical, metallurgical, hydrocarbon, you name it. It's a lot of stuff in the process. It's design. Some of it's manufacturing things. Again, it's somebody distribute, you know, building vehicle, transportation, everything. Train trains and automobiles. Uh, and recycle. And this requires a lot of resources, raw materials, energy, water, and just waste. In all of this aspect, gentlemen and ladies, there is great opportunity in each one of these steps of the life cycle of a product to improve, to be better, to be optimized or to make it better, or replace it. Uh, I like the word optimization because I think this is key, especially when we look at all the facilities, all the installations, improving, you know, from the energy balances, the use of chemicals, newer equipment, newer technology, emission control, that's a big one these days. Water usage. There's so much to be done. And it's really, in, in, it's, it's the people out there doing it, but man, we really need to get out of and, and identify these opportunities and really, really do it. Uh, so when we look at the future, guys, you know, when you go out and try to develop your product, focus on the life cycle assessment I mentioned before. Understand the whole aspect, what your product or your technology, what you're coming up with is going to play. Uh, build efficient facilities, especially now we've energy needs. If, if we can't save 10, 10 15 percent of energy used by a facility, I mean, you're making a huge impact. Or using 10 or 50 percent less chemicals, but, but still producing the same. You're making a huge impact. I mean, this amazing opportunity. Uh, safe and compliant operations, you know, obviously got to be top of it. And the key thing is imagine, get yourself motivated, get inspired, come up with ideas, and innovate. And that is the challenge that I believe as an engineer, 
it's kind of our, uh, like our purpose, right? That's what we are here, right? That, that's what we chose, that's our chosen profession. Uh, I like this, and I, I'll let you guys read it, but uh, don't stop. Uh, we have uh, a lot of challenges, and don't forget that really engineering is knowledge for the better of the engineering. So ladies and gentlemen, that's my presentation. Uh, I'm open to any questions, uh, or, yes, please. So, I have a question. You mentioned you started your business at the age of 20. Yeah. Uh, so, can you describe this to me, like, what did it look like when you were just getting started? Uh, it was just way enough. You know, we were like, did you have any co-founders or anything? No, it was, it was myself, and then my father helped me, but it was just it was myself. But then, you know, I had already worked in the industry. I started to be young in the country. Actually, my first job, my dad should have been saying that, but I was 14 years old. He put, I was in Mexico, he was working in mining. My summer job was to work the lecture, uh, clean the electrical rooms. So I, I was exposed to that industry very young, but very, a very young age. I was 22 when I was doing the projects in, you know, outside the US and in process control. So it kind of gave me that, uh, that push to do that. But yeah, it's just, it's tough, it's, but it's, it's fun, it's rewarding. I'm telling you, it's, that's what, you know, it's, a, you have the entrepreneurship in here, uh, do it. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's a well, it's a work, uh, it's, it's, it's rewarding, but it's not easy, but it's fun. So, when you first started, did you start with, like, smaller companies and doing smaller projects, and then, so, like, how did you move on to building and, like, working on PC companies like before? You know, I, I have made, on my previous uh, four years before I did it, I have made very good, uh, I've done work in Argentina and Chile with the real central DSP Gillotin. So my first job was at Kenka, Kenka. That was, uh, they had this, uh, at the old Bonneville Council, which is no longer there. Uh, that was to do a, it's a small project for a triple competitive control of uh, profiling a stockpile with lasers and this thing. Actually, it's pretty neat. And uh, and uh, and make that work. Then we got to that to the company, and then uh, had breaks in you know doing as assessments, audits, and, and big mining operations in Chile. And then uh, I got a break into the hydrocarbons in, the, in South Korea to the uh, And then just little by little, and then a lot of the work uh, we did from 2006 to 2009 was oil and gas. We lost the natural gas up in Wyoming. Uh, we got built and uh, helped build a lot of the facilities up in Wyoming and Vernon, and Utah, in the price of, you know, in 2018. Uh, we were dancing in the streets and we were, you know, without project for a while. But, uh, you know, it really changed, uh, you know, the price of 08. Uh, but what happened is then we started looking at overseas projects. In 2006, 90% of our revenue, we have about a $10 million year revenue company, so we could, kind of a really small company, you know, 40, 40 employees. But 90% of our revenue used to come from the U.S. in 2006. Today, 90% of our revenue comes from outside the U.S. A lot of it has been, you know, the policy that's pushed some of our clients out of the U.S. And we have to follow them. Uh, we have to open uh, offices outside. Not by, because I want to open up to the Dominican Republic, but we have to. So we learned the hard way how to do uh, paid and exporting and uh, taxes and I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, again, it's part of the energy entrepreneurship. But did I answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's been a fun time. It's a very similar question. And how did you get into the market? Like, did you sell your goods and services at a lower price compared to the bigger companies that, like, for example, the Rio Tinto company you gave? How did you get that deal? Was it more so you said, okay, I'll give you a 10% lower rate than they're going to do? Or no. did you just tell yourself how that worked? Uh, you know, the, the main thing is, uh, I believe in what I do, uh, I believe in the safety quality, and I use the latest technology. And always uh, creating that contact plan. Uh, you're not selling, remember, uh, a, a label. I mean, it is labor, but you're selling them an idea. You're selling them a concept. And that's what we're at. When you go in and say, hey, I can do this a little bit different. I can make this. And then have the environment to your concept. And yeah, you know, that, that's. That is the approach. It's really uh, coming up with, a, uh, with an idea and a method, and that's what's going to differentiate you rather than a process and a comparison. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, how much competition is there in controlled engineering versus other companies? You know, and, and the, there's a lot of small integration companies. Uh, the, in the Valley, there's quite a few. Uh, four or five man operations. Uh, 
outside the U.S. I mean, really, very a little small company. Then you got then you're dealing directly with the Siemens and the Emersons and all those guys. I mean, you know, uh, the uh, what what you know you have to find if you're going to do what we had to do was you know we did the automation process controls. That's why we added the commissioning aspect to it and we added the optimization so we wouldn't have these ups and downs. So you have the continuous you know, process. And, uh, and then you want to expand also in different set of markets. You know, you don't want to stick in one market. You want to differentiate yourself in different markets. But uh, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Okay. So would you say you do a lot of project solicitation where you're talking to people and saying, hey, we've looked at your process, we think we could do this better, or do they generally approach you with a problem? How does that relationship both. work? Well, for example, a lot of times we'll go in and say, okay, we would like to do an assessment. And we go in and analyze all the process control. Let's not get that mark off. Go in and say, okay, this is all you lose. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, the computer will say, oh, look, they're all automatic. If you go to the field, the valve's capitating, the instrument is in manual mode. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you go, okay guys, this is our findings. This is how we can help you. Okay, and this is, when was the last time you just, you know, I think mean, you can help them with maintenance management. You can help them with as build with drawings. Uh, and, and, or, or back engineering some of this stuff because uh, nobody kept up with changes that happened you know, throughout the years. So a lot of it is, you know, you, just, you have to put the skin in the game up, you know, and, and, and have a approach that. Yes. So how often do you have to optimize the plan? Like, how, you know, go through the assessment for the same plan? How, you know what I'm asking? You know, definitely. At the beginning, it's continuous when you're doing the ramp up phase of the, of the facility, you can call the bottleneck and you know, the whole ramp up. And just, even uh, after the commercial operations, you, your facility's gonna be doing this, you know, so it's not gonna be totally stable for about a year. Yeah. And that's where you're optimizing, you know, maximizing the use of that. Mm -hmm. Now, when it's an existing facility that has been, you know, just been maintained, operated, you know, I, I, in technology changes so much, I, I would do a baseline every maybe three or five years and see where you're at. And honestly, uh, a lot of it used to be for cost savings. Again, if you can lower the cost of energy, why not? You know, you make more money. The shareholders are going to be happier. If you use less chemicals, man, they're going to be really happy. Those are very expensive. So, uh, a lot of uh, engineers that work for the big companies that do corn and stuff like that have projects, capital projects, to look at ways to optimize the existing plant. And, you know, that's, those are fun projects, really, because you're going in and just working, but now you're trying to really squeeze <laughs> the maximum out of, uh, out of that technology, or even replace the technology with something. You said you do most of your work for mining companies. I was wondering if that has to do with just your background or is that because of the control sy systems they use in mining or? Uh, you know, on the, on the mineral, let me explain on, on mining and, and we're more on the mineral processing side. The mining is just, uh, is really the big coal packs mm -hmm. that go in and the shovels and extraction and all of that. We're more, once that is put on the thing, we're the ones that take the big rocks and make them really small and then get them uh, the trouble with the metal, right? That's where our, our expertise is. What we have seen, capital investments, you know, that type are, are pretty uh, substantial. Mm -hmm. So they're big projects. Uh, typical projects are anywhere between a billion to six billion dollars capital. Uh, so there's long term for us. And uh, really, that's that's kind of where we find our niche. And why mining? Maybe because, I don't know. I, I don't know, maybe it's because I, I, I know it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I feel I know it. So what's one area of the topic that you can make it feel more interesting in the research? You know, the algorithms. I, I think there's, there's, there's ways to do it. I mean, uh, I'm not thinking a lot of uh, coming up with uh, advanced process control strategies. I think that there's, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, you know, we got regulatory control, which is the first level PID, which is going to all that. But I think there's still a lot of work that could be done on, on the uh, more on the uh, we call it uh, uh, what's the term statistical process controls things like that. There's still a lot of work to be done that is really not being utilized as I think it should be. Yeah. 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 Y
So this, I mean, this, this is not a lot of things still out there. Uh, right now we're using system technology, uh, applying it to, you know, to, to those processes. So maybe I missed something, but um, it seems like your niche is that really um, going to companies and uh, making their processes more efficient and optimizing what they already have. Yeah, that's what one of our services. What did you start off as? Did you start off when you were 28? Did you have a product? Did you create a product, or were you going out doing the same thing? No, it's the same thing. Uh, it's, it's how, uh, we sell ideas, concepts, uh, not, not products. Uh, the first one was, you know, like you, you thought, like I mentioned, the first part was automating a, a tripper conveyor belt, utilizing lasers and to measure uh, a profile of the stockpile to optimize the use of uh, distribution of ore. So that was kind of innovative. Nobody had ever done it. And so that, that, that was easy. You know, I was kidding that, that, that was good job. Yes. Have you ever come across a system that was too complicated to handle? Yes. <laughs> uh, you, I mean, you have to, you, they, they are, I like simplicity. And a lot of times uh, what it is, something is maybe it's been overly uh, made complex. So you got to let's take it down, break it to a simple, uh, in a simple manner and really break it down. Because somebody sometimes, uh, sometimes we can get really creative. You know, as far as then this loop cascading with this on top of all of this and all of that, you go, oh my God, what are you guys doing? Just got to stop them back and maybe persuade them to change the control strategy for processes. But typically, a process that's been already proven, the actual chemistry, I mean, and it's bankable and it's a project, it's been vetted. I mean, it's been really, it's, uh, it's been engineered really where the complexity is when people that get a little creative and start adding more complexity to where it should be. But uh, having said that, we came into situations where, uh, and this is important when it comes to safety. You know, uh, we did a project, uh, an upgrade of a facility up in Wyoming, and uh, they have uh, little smoke out drums. So this, this is where the flares go out, and you can let go of the oil. You can you can take a few axes of those. Anyways, uh, so when you have a knockout drum, you have a flare. Really, what the flare is, you just burn it on the gas. That's what you have to do to go to the atmosphere. But uh, we retrofitted the whole system to a new control system now just because of one error. Watch two eyes that were switch out of you know, 10,000. The operator didn't realize that the knockout drum was full and hit an east stop uh, of the facility. So he evacuated all the gas on the facility. And honestly, it felt like uh, you were in Cape Canaveral. Uh, this, we had this uh, huge fire coming out of the stack that was probably you know, 500 feet. That's probably the scariest moment of my life. <laughs> but, but again, you see how important it is. Just, there's no room for error. Even when you're doing, and there were just two wires that, because like, that's so important to have the right and, and trust your instrumentation and signal setting and when you make the right decisions. Yes? So, how did you get, how did you prove your name out there? It seems like you only had, you know, four five years of work yes. you know, before you started your company? And do what you say and uh, say what you do and do it. <laughs> and that, that's really it. It's, it's just quality. And, and stand behind your work and, and believe in yourself and the people you're working with. And honestly, hey, if things are you're behind, be honest up front. If you run into situations, really it's your, it's your character uh, that, that, that gets you to be people. It's really your values and your, your, your essence. Even if you make an error, but you have, you know, who said that an error doesn't become a mistake until you refuse to correct it. Uh, John Kennedy said that. And I believe that. Because, you know, we will make errors. But, again, it's character. It's really being out there and people, it's trust. Somebody trust, trust what you've done over and over and then you have an experience. That, that's what builds your reputation. And that's what people want to know. Hey. Any last questions? Right, right behind you. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> um, so you mentioned it seems like you need to be able to do of this and take diagrams and um, get the diagrams and stuff like that. Right. Is that the kind of thing that uh, would be important for us to start working on? Is only working with uh, a, a company like you? It, it's good to understand it. And this is the one thing that I forgot to mention here that's very important. I don't know. 
It's called a hassle. Okay, or a PHA. A hazard operability study mm-hmm. across the hazard analysis, which is a very key point in the engineering process. And this really would be really picked your brains up. The guy put a 300 pound flange. No, he can't do that, man. <laughs> 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 but, uh, you know, but understanding, you know, just that, you know, that, that basic, how the guy's going to program, how the guy's going to, what tools does he have to, to uh, alarm, to control, to mitigate, it, it gives you a leg up. Uh, but if you can do that, I, I highly recommend it. Okay, let's give them a round of applause. And also thanks to the team for coming in. Um, I, if you guys are available after, I, you know, some may have some questions for you as well. If you don't mind, stick around for a few minutes. There is a class that comes in uh, right after us, so probably just have to come out here into the hall. So anyway, thanks guys. Great discussion. And thanks again.